Greetings. I'm Rick Peckman, Ministry Coordinator here at Detroit Lakes United Methodist Church. On behalf of our pastors, Gary and Deborah, the staff, our congregation, and myself, welcome to today's worship. We come together in worship during Lent using scripture, music, stories, allowing God to fill our hearts and our souls with his grace and love. Blessings. And let's begin with song. Cross, 
Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for cross I will ever be true it shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Now our call to worship. Welcome, friends. You're invited to journey through this season of Lent together. We walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, putting aside our fears, our doubts, and our longings. Seek to trust the God who will surprise us. We come to hear again the promises of God shared in the good news of Jesus. And please join me in the opening prayer. O God, our Deliverer, you led your people of old to the wilderness and brought them to a promised land. Guide now the people of your church that following our Savior, we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A story for all ages. I've, I've been thinking about, you know how we always have these days that just don't go so well? And then I looked in the Bible, and in John 16, it says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations or bad days. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Thank you. Thank you, God. Let me share a story about those days that don't go so well. Alexander and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day <laughs> by Judith Yours. I hope you enjoy it. I know Nick, Nick enjoyed it when I brought it to his attention. It goes like this. I went to sleep with gum in my mouth, and now there's gum in my hair, and when I get up, and when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard, and by mistake, I dropped my sweater in the sink while the water was running, and I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. At breakfast, Anthony found a Corvette Stingray car in his breakfast cereal box, and Nick found a junior undercover agent cold code ring in his breakfast cereal box. But in my cereal box, I found nothing. Any of you remember when you used to get those little gifts in your cereal box? <laughs> that would be my luck, too. I would get nothing. I think I'll move to Australia. You do that. I hate when your brothers get more and you get less. 
Well, in the carpool, Mrs. Gibson let Becky have the seat in the, with the window. Audrey and Elliot got seats by windows too. I said I was being scrunched. I said I was being smushed. I said, if I don't get a seat by the window, I'm going to get car sick. But nobody answered. I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Well, as the story goes on, it continues where nothing seems to go right for Alexander. In singing, he sang too loud. Uh, on the playground that afternoon, he, out, he finds out he's not, his, he's not the best friend anymore. Um, Paul says to him, Oh, uh, my best friends now are Albert and Philip. You can be my third best friend. Alexander replies by saying, I hope you sit on a tack, he said to Paul. I hope that the next time you get a double-decker strawberry ice cream cone, that that ice cream falls off from the cone part and lands in Australia. Alexander has this thing about Australia. Anyway, it continues the lunch. Everybody has a great lunch, but guess what? Mom forgets to pack him a dessert. Then they have to go to the dentist. His brothers have no cavity. Yeah, you got it. You know who has a cavity? Alexander. I'm going to Australia, he tells the dentist. Well, as the story continues, they get into a fight. And of course, Nick starts crying. And, he's, and, Nick, and while I was punching Nick for saying cry, Barry, cry, cry baby, sorry about that, my mom came back with the car and scolded me for being muddy and in a fight. I'm having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, I told everybody. But no one answered. So then they went to this so then we all went to the shoe store to buy some sneakers. Anthony chose white ones with blue stripes. Nick chose red ones with white stripes. I chose blue ones with red stripes, but of course, the shoe man said, we're out of those in your size. Nothing's going right for poor Alexander. When, he, when we picked up Dad at his office, I couldn't play with, um, at his office, he said, I couldn't play with his copy machine, but I forgot. He also said, watch out for the books on the desk, and I was careful, I thought, but my elbow accidentally hit something. He also said, don't fool around with the phone. But I think I was calling Australia. My dad said, please don't pick anything up anymore. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My bath was too hot. I got soap in my eyes. My marble went down the drain, and I had to wear my railroad train pajamas. I hate my railroad train pajamas. When I went to bed, Nick took back the pillow he said I could keep, and the Mickey Mouse night lamp burned out, and I bit my tongue. The cat wants to sleep with Anthony, not with me. It was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. My mom said, some days are like that, even in Australia. You know, we all have bad days, but like in John 6.33, just remember that God takes care of us. I have said these things to you, that in me you have peace. The world, in the world you'll find tribulations, but I have, uh, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Blessings. as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou pits me
Welcome back to the second in our series of Claiming God's Promise, or Claim God's Promise. This morning we have two different scripture passages in which God provides a promise to people and they find it so incredulous, so wonderful perhaps, that it is not claimed, at least not initially. The first one comes to us from uh, the covenant established with God and Abram, and it comes to us from the 17th chapter, the first through the seventh verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, your name will be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful, I will make nations of you, and the kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you. And then the 15th verse and 16th, God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down and laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah actually bear a child? at the age of 90. Then we turn to our New Testament passage from Mark, and we find Jesus providing a promise. God is going to uh, send him to die and to rise again. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and uh, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the cross to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, 
but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for you to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your souls? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? If any of you are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed, ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Here ends the reading from God's holy word. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of these, your children, be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for truly you are the rock and the redeemer. Amen. So what's in a name? Some names are pretty unique, aren't they? When we first came to your congregation as your interim team, many people had difficulty with our name. It's a hyphenated last name, Ball Kilborn. And some people really struggled with that. I was called more than once uh, Pastor Kilborn Ball. And finally I said, it's just Deborah. Some names are short, others are quite long. Many tongue twist the most able of us. And that is true for town names as well. Perhaps you realize that there is a town in Northern Wales in Europe that has 58 characters in it. It's a mouthful. I can't pronounce it, so I'm going to spell it for you this morning. L-L-A-N-F-A-I-R-P-W-L-L-G-W-Y-N-G-Y-L-L-G-O-G-E-R-Y-C-H-W-Y-R-N-D-R-O-B-W-I-L-L-I-A-N-T-Y-S-I-L
El Shaddai, God Almighty. Prior to that time, we predominantly have the name Elohim. In English, we just refer to it as God. But El Shaddai describes God's work literally, the God who makes a way where there is no way. I think we should be pretty familiar by now with that name, for we have just now returned to face-to-face -face worship in our congregation, and for 10, 11 months, something like that, we were out of our building. We should remember that God reminds us to keep God's divine promises because God makes a way where we see none. And yet, God does. Claiming the promise is a part of our journey in faith. Paul says it clearly in Galatians 3, verse 29, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs of the promise which we can claim. And what about our second passage? Jesus has been on the move in the Gospel of Mark, always spreading his mission. He's already traveled way beyond Galilee, and now he and the disciples have journeyed far to the northeast to his disciples, and he asks his disciples, who are now with him in Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? Peter has uttered his belief, his strong belief, that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And yet he reacts a few verses later in shock when Jesus states it is God's will that he will suffer, be rejected, die, and rise again. The rebuke is swift from Peter, but it's even more swift from Jesus. Get behind me, Satan, he says to Peter. Peter is firmly put in his place. In Matthew's version of the same event, Jesus affirms Jesus' awareness that he follows the Messiah, or Peter's awareness, that Peter and other disciples are following the Messiah, the son of the living God. As God had with Abram and Sarai, Jesus then calls Simon Peter blessed. And he continues, I tell you that you are Peter, Petra, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church and the gates of death will not overcome it. Peter is called the rock. Peter is called Petra. Now pronouncing the name of a town in northern Wales is tough. Not anything like these stories. The message is clear and challenging. Christians are invited to claim the promise the stakes are high, the consequences are eternal, and the compass used in the journey points directly to God. Nothing less than complete devotion is asked. Names are changed as we devote ourselves to God's plan. As we follow God's plan for our lives in our own day, our name has been changed also. We have become known as the followers, or the way, or most commonly, Christian. Robert Fulgham, author of It Was on Fire When I Lay Down on It, recalls one of the most startling lessons he received as a student. The class had been thinking of the meaning of life when the professor pulled out of his pocket a little shard of mirror that he had found shattered on the road when he was much younger as a boy. The professor told how he used to delight in shining its reflective light into dark places where the sun never shined in deep holes and crevices and dark closets. It became a childhood game to attempt to get light into the most inaccessible place that I could find. Remembering that event in that classroom, Robert Fulgham writes, as a man, I grew to understand that this child's game was just a child's game. But more than that, it was a metaphor for, for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of the light, but light will only shine in many dark places as I reflect it. Perhaps others will see and do likewise. This is what I am now about. This is the meaning of my life. Each of us receives a new name, and that name change occurred as we began to follow Jesus in meaningful ways. 
Can you guess what it is? It is connected to the most important job we will ever have in life. We are followers of Jesus. We are light bearers in the darkness. Your name, my name, is Christian. Thankfully, that name is short. May we rejoice in it. May we live into it all the days of our lives. May we claim God's promises. Amen? Amen. As we come to our prayer time, I invite each of you to confess your sins this morning, privately, quietly, silently. God hears them, and God provides us with hope and renewal. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for the example of Abraham and for all the saints who have gone before us for those who waited in patience for your promises to come to pass, for those who lived in hope while around them they saw only darkness, for those who witnessed to you when it was not considered the proper thing to do, for those who forgot their own selves in their desire to obey your commands and to respond to your call upon their lives. Help us today, O oh God, Help us to examine the level of our faith, to look seriously at our resistance to talk about the cross or of sacrifice, to consider in prayer our reluctance to give up the things of this world, to risk our reputations, our comfort, our security for the sake of following you, for the sake of witnessing to you, for the sake of obeying you. Lord, hear our prayer this day as we remember persons for whom we have been asked to pray, and they include Betty, Jan, Judy, Nancy, baby Eli, baby Addison, Howard, Jean, and Jerry, Anne, Mitch, Britt, and their unborn baby, Gail and Paul, Scott and wife Gail, Bill and Diane, and their extended family, and the family of Bob. Hear us, O Lord, as we pray for these persons. And now, O God, we remember that you have promised your forgiveness, and so we are assured of that forgiveness. Christ forgave us while we were yet sinning, that is proof of God's love for us. Amen. This week we celebrate with the following people. Happy birthday to Wally, Chris, Olivia, Russ, Brian, Dave, Jason, Reva, and Rick. And happy anniversary to Steve and Marsha. Tonight the Lenten book study led by Pastor Gary will be held via Zoom at 6.30 p.m. Tomorrow night, the Church Council will meet via Zoom at 6.30 p.m. Tuesday, March 2nd, the Tuesday Morning Bible Study Group will begin meeting again here at the Church in the Fellowship Hall at 9.30 a.m. Wednesday, the United Methodist Women's Group will meet here at the Church at 1.30 p.m. Wednesday night at 6.15 p.m., we'll meet for our in-person TGIW worship. Please call to reserve a spot if you're interested in attending that service. Reva's Bible Study Group will meet Thursday morning at 10 a.m. in the Fireside Room. And this week's uh, Zoom meeting of the gentlemen has been canceled due to Rick being out of town this week. You'll meet again on Thursday, the 18th of March. And as always, your offerings can continue to be mailed into the church at 885 Pembina Trail. You can drop them off with Beth in the office. You can bring them on Sunday morning or Wednesday evening to worship. Or you can give online through our website at dlumc.org. Thank you. Jesus walked this lonesome valley. He had to walk it by himself. Oh, nobody else. 
house and walk it for him. He had to walk it by himself. We must walk this lonesome valley. Hear now the words of assurance. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. That is proof of God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are truly forgiven. Amen. Hear also the benediction. Who are we? We are a missionary force of Christians. What do we do? We offer the care and compassion of Christ. To whom? To all. Where do we meet you? Wherever you are on life's journey. Go forth to claim God's promises. Move in your life through acts of faith. Open your ear to God's divine revelation and promise. Depend on God who is wise. Do all of these things so that all that is right and good permeates each day until we meet again. Amen.